The film starts in a post-apocalyptic world where a guy named Dan falls from the sky into a pool full of people. While the situation he finds himself in is crazy, his story really starts 28 years earlier in Miami when he's bringing over some supplies for the Christmas party in 2022. After handing the things to his daughter Miri, Dan goes over to his wife Emmy and happily tells her that he is going to get a research job that very evening. Dan has served in the military, but he now teaches biology to high school students and he really wants to be part of a research facility. So he leaves the party to take the call from the hiring agency, and this is when he gets the news that the company has hired someone else. Dan is completely heartbroken, and he lets off some steam by kicking the garbage cans. He then goes back inside his house to watch a football match with his daughter, who cheers him up by telling him that one day his dreams will come true. Muri's words make Dan feel better, and he once again starts paying attention to the match. Suddenly, an explosion brings armed soldiers onto the pitch before Sergeant Diaz, who's leading these men, tells the world that 28 years into the future, humanity is about to go extinct. She begs the world to send soldiers to help defeat an alien invasion in the future, and with that announcement, the world changes forever. Governments around the world build facilities for time travel and start sending thousands of soldiers on seven-day trips to fight the aliens. However, only a handful of these soldiers survive their trip, and it becomes clear that the war is a lost cause. One day, in all of this madness, Dan is asking his class to share their thoughts, but only one student named Martin raises his hand because he wants to talk about volcanoes. The other students are wondering what's the point of doing anything when they're going to die anyway in 28 years. Dan reminds them that the world needs scientists more than ever right now because only they can find a solution to this seemingly impossible problem. He's talking about this when he receives a message telling him to visit the nearest conscription center right away. There, some military personnel start doing physical tests on him and they find out that he's going to die in 2030 so he is an ideal candidate to fight this war. The news about his death shocks Dan, who's trying to look for answers, when after a painful series of events, a device is attached to his forearm. The officer then orders him to report for duty in 24 hours or he will be sent to jail and one of his family members will be forced to take his position in the war. That afternoon, Emmy's talking to the survivors of the war when Dan comes there to give her the news. She is beside herself because she knows that the chances of Dan's survival are next to none. She begs him to ask his dad to remove the device so he can avoid getting drafted, but Dan hates his father and barely keeps any contact with him. Still, he drives to meet his estranged dad James, who is an ex-military engineer and provides illegal services to a rather shady group of guys. He says he can remove the device from Dan's hand with ease, but just then they get into an argument and Dan starts blaming his dad for abandoning him when he was a child. James tells his son that after coming back from Vietnam, he was suffering from PTSD and that's why he ended up leaving them behind. He's trying to apologize, but Dan doesn't accept his apology and leaves immediately. He goes back to say goodbye to Emmy and Miri, who let him go after he promises that he will come back in seven days no matter what. That evening, he goes to report for duty, where Defense Secretary William tells the soldiers that they are fighting for the very survival of humanity. These recruits are given some basic training, and during the orientation, Dan meets Charlie and Dorian, who are going to be part of his unit. After the orientation, Charlie shares that Dorian has gone back to the future three times and he was the first guy ever to kill an alien, which is known as a white spike. Dan is part of the research unit, and some scientists from the future explain how they can only move between two fixed timelines, so they can't just stop the alien invasion before it starts. That night, the recruits are trying to get some rest when Dan starts talking to Charlie, who has already lost his wife in this battle. He's talking about how he works for a high-tech company when suddenly alarms go off around the facility. Diaz tells everyone to get ready for the time jump and all the recruits gather in the courtyard where they start getting sucked into a force field. The officers say they will appear 5 to 10 feet above the ground so they should get ready but after getting sucked into the force field, Dan learns that something is wrong because they come out in the sky and most of the recruits die on the impact. Dan is one of the lucky ones who fall into a deep pool and he notices that Charlie also survived the fall. They are shocked to see how the city of Miami has been destroyed by the aliens who are now eating people alive in the streets. Dan is wondering what to do next when he starts getting orders from a colonel who asks Dan's unit to extract a research team from a nearby lab before the city comes under an air raid. After getting these orders, Dan gathers what remains of his unit and they start walking through the street which have been littered with dead bodies. 
The lab is on the seventh floor, and there they get their first glimpse of a dead white spike. The recruits are looking at this monstrosity when Dorian cuts off its claw and keeps it as a souvenir. Meanwhile, another soldier shows Dan the dead bodies of all the scientists. After learning that their researchers are dead, the colonel orders Dan to secure some vials from inside the lab. Dan and his team search the lab, and soon he finds the blue vials. After he tells the colonel that he has secured the chemicals, he's ordered to meet with the extraction team in six minutes unless he wants to get caught up in the air raid. He tells everyone to get out of the building using the back staircase and asks everyone to go down quietly, but his efforts to sneak out are in vain as the aliens notice the escaping soldiers from the top floor and begin their assault. The soldiers try to shoot down the aliens, but the bullets seem to have no effect on these monsters. Dan manages to get out of the staircase, but an alien is coming his way. He empties both of his guns at this beast before grabbing an axe and shoving it in its head. The alien, however, is still alive and only dies after Dorian blows away its chest with his shotgun. While the recruits are running through the streets, the aliens are right behind them and the fighter jets are also approaching the city. The bombing raid is about to start and Dan and the others are relieved to see the extraction team. The relief, however, doesn't last long as the aliens take down the extraction team with ease, forcing the recruits to fight for survival. Dan manages to kill an alien, but these monsters are firing spikes which are taking down soldiers left and right. When the bombing begins, Dan has no choice but to ask everyone to take cover. They're crossing a bridge when a guy falls into a tunnel. Against Dorian's advice, Dan runs to save the guy, and this causes his entire unit to get stuck in a really tricky situation. Dan realizes he can't save everyone, so he finally tells the survivors to make a run for it, but it's too late, and they get caught up in the blast. Dan wakes up next to Charlie in what looks like a busy military base. They go to check up on Dorian, who's mad at Dan for giving the wrong order which costs the lives of many others. Dorian says that the war is already lost, and he only keeps coming back because he has stage 4 cancer and he wants to die on the battlefield. Their emotional conversation is interrupted when a soldier asks for Dan who is taken to the colonel. The colonel is thanking him for saving those vials when a soldier calls her by Dan's surname. This is when Dan figures out that the woman standing in front of him is none other than his own daughter Miri, who is not only a distinguished biologist but also the founder of this whole resistance effort. Dan's happy to see her, but she explains that mankind is about to go extinct in a matter of weeks so she doesn't have time to be sentimental. She then shows Dan the thermal image of a female white spike, which according to Muri, is extremely rare and responsible for the survival of the species. Muri wants to find out why the female white spikes don't die even to the poison that can kill male aliens with ease. So she gets into a chopper with Dan and they fly to the nest where the female is being kept. On the way, Dan can see the aliens eating all sorts of living animals. He also learns that the aliens appeared mysteriously in 2048 on a Russian island and in three years they had reduced humanity to less than a million people. Soon they get to the nest where the soldiers are trying to trap the female white spike inside a cage, but the alien is thrashing them around. Miri jumps in to help them and while she's trying to trap it, Dan notices a horde of aliens rushing towards the nest. He disobeys Miri's orders and after shooting down an alien, he gets into the nest to help her. With some luck, they manage to get the beast inside the cage before it's transported out of there by a chopper. Miri and Dan, on the other hand, have to run, and they almost get crushed by another helicopter. They're surrounded by the aliens, so they get inside a Humvee, and Miri uses its machine gun to mow down the monsters that are trying to catch them. Meanwhile, Dan drives like a madman and gets the Humvee out of there as soon as they are on the beach away from the chaos. After firing a flare to signal her location, Muri gets mad at Dan, saying that she needs him for a specific mission so he has to stay alive. When Dan asked her about his death, she gets emotional and explains with teary eyes that he left his family behind when she was only 12 and at 16 years old she had to watch him die in the ICU after he got into an accident. Dan can't believe he would ever abandon his family, but he knows that his daughter is telling the truth. After a helicopter picks them up, they are taken to the biggest military base which is located in the middle of the ocean. The female white spike is also brought there and Dan learns that Muri is trying to discover the toxin that can work on all kinds of white spikes. She's running thousands of tests and he leaves her alone after saying that he's really proud of her. By the next morning, Muri is feeling defeated since she hasn't found the right toxin yet. 
Dan tells her to take a break, but this is when she shares that even if she finds the toxin, they don't have the resources to deploy it before the aliens wipe out every living organism on the planet. She wants Dan to take the toxin back to his time so that he can stop the invasion before it gets out of hand. Dan doesn't want to leave her behind, but before they can discuss it anymore, the computer notifies them that it has created a toxin that's going to work on 100% of the White Spike population. Muri is ecstatic with this success, but just then, thousands of White Spikes break through the barriers of this marine base and they are coming to save the female White Spike. Dan will be going back to the past in 7 minutes and Miri decides to take him airborne to keep him safe until then. So they start running towards the helipad while the base is being ravaged by the aliens. Unfortunately, they're soon surrounded by multiple aliens and they have to shoot them down and even burn some of them to find an escape. They're close to the helipad when Miri gets stabbed by a spike and Dan runs to help her. He tries to take her away to safety, but she asks him to stop since she can't move anymore. She tells him how happy she is to see him once again. With only seconds remaining before the time jump, Miri falls down from the platform and Dan jumps after her. However, he gets transported back to the past before he even touches the water. He's in shock and after giving him some first aid, Diaz asks him what's in the vial. He tells her it's the toxin that can kill the aliens and hands it over to her so they can mass produce it. Dan is happy to see that Charlie also survived, but after meeting him, Emmy notices that he is in shock as his hands are shaking violently. After getting back home, Dan is happy to see Muri and he gives her a big hug. That night, he tells Emmy how their daughter is going to save the world in the future. He's wondering why the aliens didn't get detected before the invasion began in 2048, and this is when Emmy says that the alien ship might not have been detected because they landed before 2048. Dan likes her theory and immediately goes to meet Dorian to ask for his help. After explaining that he wants to save the world just to keep his promise to his daughter, he asks Dorian if he still has that claw. The two of them take the claw to Charlie, who finds ash particles belonging to a Chinese volcano on the surface of the alien appendage. They realize that they need to find a volcano expert, so Dan talks to Martin, who claims that in 946 AD, a Chinese volcano exploded and its ash got trapped under a Russian glacier. They use environmental models to find out that the glacier will melt in 2048, which makes it clear that the alien ship is hiding under it. They want to go to Russia to end this invasion, but the defense secretary doesn't give them permission to use military planes for this mission. With no other choice, Dan once again goes to meet James, and this time he pleads to his father to help him get to this remote Russian island. James wants to help his son, so he agrees and on the same day, Dan meets Sergeant Diaz and her men who are bringing a lot of toxin for this mission. After getting to this frozen Russian island, they use snowmobiles to find the location of the ship. They scout for hours and eventually, Dan notices his GPS and compass acting strangely. He walks around for a bit and comes across a giant crater. They use a large amount of dynamite to blow away the snow from this crater before entering the glacier through some caves. After searching the caves, they eventually find the ship and decide to destroy it themselves because if they involve the government, there is a good chance that the aliens will end up escaping. So they cut open the ship, and Dan asks James and Charlie to stay outside and stop any aliens from escaping the cave. He then enters the ship and finds a dead alien crew, which means the ship accidentally ended up on Earth. Deeper in the ship, they find many dormant white spikes inside embryos, and they immediately begin to poison these monsters. But this is when things go south as some of the aliens escape the ship. Outside, James and Charlie use guns and even metal cutters to take out the aliens. Meanwhile, Dorian tells Dan that they have to blow up the ship before any more aliens escape. Dan knows it's the only option, so he leaves Dorian behind and runs to get out of the cave before the ship explodes. After barely surviving the explosion, he runs to meet his dad who says that a female alien managed to get out and is now roaming the island. Dan knows that they have to stop it before it lays eggs, so they start looking for it, and after spotting it in the distance, James takes a few sniper shots to hurt it. The white spike starts running towards him, but Dan gets there to help his dad. The father-son duo shoots the alien multiple times, but a blizzard gives it the chance to survive. Dan and James are trying to locate it through the snow when it suddenly attacks them and they have to use anything they can find to stab it. They manage to blind it, and Dan even destroys its arm by injecting it with the poison, but he's cornered and the alien is coming for him. 
This is when James distracts it with the scent of his blood, and when the alien rushes towards him, Dan stabs it in the back before injecting more poison into its head. He then kicks it down the glacier, and its body explodes after hitting a rock. The father-son duo then lies down in the snow alongside Charlie as the three of them try to catch their breath. The next day, while the Secretary of Defense is taking credit for destroying the alien ship, Dan returns home to his wife and daughter who are over the moon to see him. The film ends with Dan finally introducing his daughter to her grandfather who feels lucky to be part of Dan's loving family. If you enjoyed that recap, I got a good feeling you'll enjoy this one too. Click on the video on your screen for more.